Hey folks, back uh, back now. Chris Garlock and Michael Redman with our next game in our AlphaGo versus the World Series. We're looking at uh, all 60 games of the uh, the MasterGo Magister uh, AlphaGo with its two versions, Magister and Master. I, thought, I think we've been mostly in the Masters uh, recently, right, Michael? I think that's uh, I remember. Um, well, it's the same version, just changing its handle name. So it, it's sort of hard for me to follow. We just call it Master. It's master. Yeah, sounds good. All right, so we have a new player today, but this is uh, somebody we know well and uh, we'll be seeing several times, I believe. Yes, Guli came for the first time to this uh, set of games. Um, Guli Nindan. Um, he doesn't really need much of an introduction, if you ask me. Maybe someone doesn't know him. So he, he was a eight-time world champion. And, you know... Most of those were, I guess they were all before this game. So um, he was maybe one of the most successful Chinese professionals. And when I was, um, actually, I think I played him once. Um, he, he was, I, I've been seeing a lot of him in my career as a professional and as a commentator of games. So he's, he's been a very prominent Chinese player. How would you describe his style? I think his style um, is actually a bit closer to Japanese players than most Chinese players. Like he, he has, um, he always relied on very good positional judgment, and he was okay with keeping things calm or going for a big moyo and stuff like that. In fact, in this game, you're going to see him play the San Nensei. and so his game was his games are relatively easy to understand, but he. I think he got to where he got with um, positional judgment, mostly, and very strong fighting power. Well, I can't wait to see how this goes. I'm, I'm sure I've seen it before, but it's, it's almost like seeing these games for the first time, so that's kind of cool. Okay, so Guli has the Black Stones, and he's going to play um, a kind of a Gosegen version of the Sun Nensei, because Gosegen liked to suggest that Black should play these Kakaris um, in the two corners and then just leave them like this. And it turns out that while this was an exciting opening to play, I played it myself for black, um, it turns out that computer programs just do not like playing in the middle of a side. So they don't even like the sun and say. So just to show you what might be suggested is like, for instance, jumping into the 3-3 three, three point here um, this was by far the most popular move for a while after we started using programs like Lila Zero and like this. Or even at this point, Black could be playing an attachment against the upper left corner. Um, some local, this variation also, this Joseki, is just so popular. Even now, it was popular almost immediately after AlphaGo came to the scene. Uh, something like this might happen. And you see again, when the computer generates a variation, you're going to see the 3-3 three, three invasion pretty soon. And so this is something that could happen. They just don't like the... But this was an opening that I... Um, the San Jose itself was an opening that I was fascinated with for a while. Um, like, that was about 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's a long time ago. But like, and Takemiya used it with great success in Japan. Um, for a few years, he was um, invincible with the Sun Insane. Like he, he won almost all of his games one year. White plays the Kakari. And here Guli plays the Pinsir. This is the this is the old style basically. It was the way we used the Sun Insane at the time. Nowadays you will see players play this move, which we thought was an, an handicapped Joseki. It turns out computer programs like this variation better. It's, it's sort of hard to fathom for me. And Black would follow up with either A or B. I, I would probably choose B just to justify this black stone here. And um, it looks like a pretty even game, actually. But uh, just this um, a, a attachment and extension here that Black adds, building this influence is one way that actually works pretty well with the Black's Moyo on the right half of the board. Black's sun inside position does work fairly well with this the way Black is sort of establishing a wall up to the sixth line, making it high like this. It does work to a certain extent. So it's something that actually is worth trying for people, something mm -hmm. that could. This is the traditional way, 
But of course, allowing white into the through three point is now considered to be a bit um, weak on territory, maybe a bit slack, you might say. And for the first time, I think this was a new move at the time. For the first time, AlphaGo shows this variation where we thought that this move was vulgar. So the Joseki up to this point was that white was supposed to play here. Of course. And later on, white would be threatening to play here. Uh -huh. uh, AlphaGo just wants to take Sente, black bumps against and plays a Hane. And if black follows up with a double Hane, white is going to play away. White's going to play maybe, maybe this way. I think at this point, AlphaGo is going to play this way. Like maybe now a computer program would just dive into the three point. I, I still sort of don't like these direct three threes sometimes, but this is a move that would be probably suggested now. But black, I think it was good for black to play away once, but at some point, it's, this is going to be a very important move for black to play. So white does have a kind of a, um, a sente for white that's waiting to happen because at some point black's going to have to come back and play that mark point. Um, and, and so since it is a new move, I want to just spend just a second on it because, I mean, I you know I don't know a ton of Josekis, but I certainly know you know this is this one is baked in, especially for anybody that played Samra and say as you said you know back in the day, you know, everybody knows that one, and and I agree. I mean, I, if I had have played that bumping against that. Just that would have got me a big smack in the hand from my teacher. So, yeah. what is what is the idea? I mean, I, I'm not quite understanding. You know, to well, bump I think against the it. Is and, when white plays here, um, this is just not as effective as one might expect. Like, even if black plays the um, the fighting variation, black can connect up on here. And although this is a variation that was played a lot by human players. Sure. White does end up with a relatively weak group in the center of the board. Okay. And so I think the valuation of this situation is relatively good for black. And I think it is important that black got in this approach move here. So that makes a difference because it's in the perfect point in this variation, right? And without that, white would be playing a pincer on the lower side. So there is that. And there's the fact that when white plays here, uh, white is there is a uh, hidden threat that at some point white is going to play this move and have a fairly good position on the lower side. And in this variation, this stone is in a awkward position. Like black would rather be playing an approach from the left side of the board instead of having this stone on the lower side because it's going to come under attack, this black stone. The whole area is controlled by white when white plays one and three here. So I think it's, in this particular board position, it has a lot to do with the fact that Black has already played that approach move in the lower left corner. The fact that this stone, in this variation, there is that possibility that that stone is going to become wasted when White plays here later. And in the other variation, where White has played here, that stone actually comes into use. And it's a very useful stone to have a Black stone here surrounding the territory and making a base for this black group is very useful. So the fact that in the old Joseki, this black stone is coming into use, and in the AlphaGo Joseki, it's potentially going to become a bad move. Uh, I think that difference is what makes this move um, so effective in this particular board position. So I'm not going to say that this white move is going to be good in every board position. Gotcha. Good? So, Thank you. White pinchers on the upper side, and black plays here. Now, this was another move we saw a lot of. We still see it sometimes in modern Go. Um, and actually, um, I think Kadago was suggesting that this would have been better, just playing this way. Um, but but Guli played here. And the idea is that if white answers here and black plays here, and if white answers again, then black gets just a little bit extra forcing moves. Then, then black could start attacking probably would probably probably just play here and start attacking on the upper side. And the fact that black has a potential eye here makes a big difference. In the game, white extended. And this, this connection on the third line was actually a move that I had not seen very much before. Um, 
But it's a very effective move in this position because if white plays an extension here, then black can play a honey, and black will have a living shape on the upper side. So this is um, taking away black's living shape by playing here, but it's better than extending down like this because then black would get this forcing move. Mm -hmm. So I was impressed by this move. It's still putting some pressure on the black group. But at this point in the game, um, let's see. Um, it's still pretty good for black. I mean, uh, it's pretty close to 50% still. So um, it's, it's still supposed to be a fairly even game. Black plays here and extends. And white pushes here. And this was a point where black could have had a fairly good game if black had just cut here and taken the one stump. So this would give black a living shape. White will probably extend here. And black can go back to the lower side. This would, uh, black would still have close to 50% winning percentage here. So this is actually would be better than um, any other player in this series because this is move number 39 if black plays this way. And it's almost dead even. In the game, black played the honey on top, allowing white to play here and have a connected position here. This actually um, made the game slightly advantageous for white. White has 55%, black has 45% winning percentage after this. And that means, um, that translates to about four, four points before Comey. So um, assuming the computer is correct and assuming perfect play, it means black is gonna lose by two and a half points. So that's still a pretty close game. Black extends, white jumps. And this is where it was apparent to me watching the game that it was not really working for black when black pushed through here and peeped and white did not answer it. And um, although pushing through here set up that peep, it's um, making filling one of black's liberties with these three stones. So it's gonna make the cut here uh, a huge threat that white has against black. So it was, it, it was a bit of an ugly move that did not work out so well. Black would have liked to be able to push through and have white connect here and then play like this, in which case white would not have a living shape yet, yet on the upper side. But when white crawls here, now if black pulls back and white plays here, now white will have a living shape there. So um, there's just the fact that it was sort of refuted by white crawling here once. And at this point, white is already at about 60% winning percentage. And so Black's going, going to win by only two or three points before Comey. Um, and White gets to cut here. So this is just trouble for Black, basically. Um, I'll just, it, it just gradually, very, very gradually got worse and worse for Black. So at this point, White has this living shape on the upper side and is looking at the ladder here. The ladder here is if white gets to escape from this ladder, it's going to be bad. So black has to be very careful about that. It's just these very relatively minor points. The fact that black's group here is not yet 100%. For the time being, white is going to sacrifice these two zones. But sometimes they're going to get moving and start attacking black on the upper side. There's just so many things that black has to worry about that black will not have time to surround the moyo on the right. And so just to show you uh, this move here, this was a ladder breaking move. And White got that extra tempo to make a shape on the right side. And you can see Muli is playing very strongly fighting. But um, at this point, it's pretty apparent that like White is just taking control again. Uh, there's Bad Aji in the upper right corner, Black's territory on the right side. This territory, it's open on both sides, so it's not very big territory. Uh, there's There's a... There's some bad Aji with this territory with the three stones here and a shortage of liberties. So white can play underneath, for instance. White can play on the first line here and it's gonna be difficult for black to cut off that one white stone. Black doesn't have very much territory because they're all, all of the territories have been sort of limited by the way white plays. And it's really amazing to see this happen to a player like Gu Li because he's a super strong fighter and he's also a good positional player. Um, it's usually very um, difficult to, to, for anyone to, to get him like that. Fascinating. I mean, it has a whole different feel uh, to me, just uh, 
um, it, with, with Gouli's play. It's very, very solid. Uh, I mean, you can really feel. I mean, you, you, this is this is what an, you know a, a eight-time world champion looks like, and and you know, and he, he's not making any. Uh, I don't want to call him you know blunders because the other folks weren't necessarily making blunders, but I mean, he's he's uh, doesn't seem overly uh, worried. By he, Alpha he's Alpha playing through steadily. Yeah, and I've been looking at the the scores that my computer programs were giving Guli, the. Um, his losing was very gradual. He was yeah. just points at a time. And so he was sort of hanging in there. Um, but even saying that, it, it was very surprising. At this point in the game, it was quite apparent that White had outplayed Black, and it was surprising to see that happen to Gouli, a player like right. Gouli. Right. Well, we're going to see it again a couple times, if I'm not mistaken. So, so <laughs> stay tuned. Stay tuned, folks. More to come. But uh, that's it for today's game. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Michael. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Thanks for watching.